you know, so I mean, if you look around the, each row, there's about 20 people in each row. And, and as my other students, if you look at the, your neighbors right next to you, one of you is probably going to be a CEO in a company, but one fifth of you are going to join executive leadership, but one fifth of you are going to be senior managers, uh, one fifth are going to be consultants. So out of 20 people, four people are consultants, four people are executives, four leadership, four people are senior managers, four people are entrepreneurs, and four or five people are going to not, they're not sure where they're going to be. So why should you listen to this talk? Why should you be here? I mean, the main thing is that you want to end up, you want to end up having a plan and moving forward to where you are in your career and getting to where you want to be 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the road. My talk is titled leadership skills of 2025, but you're looking at, you're finishing up your corporate careers at the year 2050. And so how are things going to be different in 2050? What kind of skills are you going to have that are different? By a series of fortunate accidents, I fell in love and was forced to go to the US. I was forced to join engineering uh, because those days there were only two careers. I think you became a doctor and became an engineer. Uh, I. I didn't have many choices in life, and by a series of like fortunate accidents, I ended up where I am. Fortunately, I'm very happy where I am. But along the way, we have lots of friends who haven't ended up where they are, who are not that happy where they are, and, and they are not any brighter or work less hard than any of us. So my objective here is to try to help you get to where you want to be 5, 10, 15, and 20 years down the road. Uh, what skills are the, and the, so the question is, what skills do you need to do that? Uh, and, and what skills do you need to do that? And how can you achieve that? So the first question, the first thing, even before I start my talk, is I think it's very important to have a career plan. Uh, what does that mean? Who's going sort to of come sit down and write a career plan? I mean, I've got so many courses to do, so many homeworks to do. The last thing I want to do is write a career plan. One thing that we found is by just writing a one page career essay on where you want to be in five years is very important and it's much harder than you think. Um, now people are going to say, well, you know, it's going to change. I don't know what kind of job I'm going to get or where I'm going to be. On the other hand, there's an, I mean, there's an old management saying, it says that if you uh, fail to plan, you can always plan to fail where you are, except if you get a series of fortunate accidents, which is not that, uh, probability is not, not that high. So it's, I think it's very, so I think one of the first things you start with in terms of developing your skills, if you're figuring out where you want to be, is write a one page of where you are. And what we've done, we've been doing this for many, many years um, with our students. And over the last 20 years, we've had students that do this for a lifetime. Every five years, they figure out where they want to be. Now the plans change, uh, bad things happen, good things happen. But to write a one page of where you want to be in five years, come back and see where you are, you can really appreciate all that you've achieved and you can figure out what you want, what skills you need to do to get there. So that's takeaway number one. Now let me kind of talk to you about where I'm from. Uh, I'm from Pittsburgh in the sense that I've lived there more than I've lived any place in my life. I've lived I've spent the last 30 years in Pittsburgh. We have lots of rivers, uh, but I would much rather be in Mysore today than Pittsburgh because it's probably five degrees below zero and snowing there. Uh, but Pittsburgh is one of the more beautiful cities in the world to live in. Uh, the University of Pittsburgh itself that I'm a part of uh, was founded a few years ago. It's one of the oldest universities uh, that are west of the Mississippi. Uh, we have somewhere between 32 to 35,000 students depending on how one counts it. Uh, but we charge, you know, so we're a public university when we want to be, we're a private university when we want to be. Um, we have 16 different schools, we have many, many university centers and all kinds of stuff. So it's an old, old university, it's been around a long, long time. Uh, we have a great business school, uh, many of Dr. Shishadri's friends are part of the business school. So one of the things you're looking at is the possibility of collaborating with Myra on a number of dimensions. So that's, it's, very, it's very special that I'm out here today for that reason. Uh, life in Pittsburgh itself, it's a big sports town. Uh, just like you have the, what should I say, the your cricket leagues here, 
football, American football is popular there. We have great museums. Uh, we have the Andy Warhol Museum. Andy Warhol was from the city of Pittsburgh. And there's a special tradition between, in, between, uh, between Indians and uh, Pittsburgh. Uh, the, the largest Indian temple and the first Indian temple uh, was really built in Pittsburgh from with artisans from Tirupati. And uh, what should I say, even now, many of the Indians that have been in the US for a long time come to Pittsburgh every year. In fact, uh, my roommates, uh, my college roommates, my roommate now is my wife, but before that, uh, my college roommate's uh, wife is probably one of the most powerful women in the world. She's from this area, Indra Nui. She runs PepsiCo. Uh, she, even now, she comes to Pittsburgh every year. She's got a very busy schedule. She comes to the private plane after breakfast, spends one hour, two hours in Pittsburgh, and goes back for lunch. Uh, so there's a huge tradition. Each time between India and Pittsburgh, an Indian community has helped the Pittsburgh, has helped the Pittsburgh region in many, many different ways. There are, like, oh, I think, 2,500 Indian doctors alone in Pittsburgh. So there's a special connection between India and Pittsburgh in many, many different ways. So how does that have to do, what does that have to do with you? What does the future hold? And how can you improve your skills to be a leader down the road? If you look at what's happening, the greatest life event that you folks are, have experienced is the whole new global economy. Uh, when I grew up here in Mysore, I went, you know, I went to Nirmala Convent for a few years. Uh, uh, what should I say? The Indian economy is completely closed. Uh, we had almost no connection with the West except through a, what should I say, shaky transistor radio that you could see once in a while. Uh, and it's difficult to imagine that. Uh, and it wasn't that long ago. Uh, we are old, but not that old. Um, so new global economy was a big thing. So, and the next generation jobs uh, is also something that you folks have to be concerned with for many, many different reasons, as you'll see. Uh, and the question is, how can you be a leader in 2025 or even 2050? Uh, what kinds of skills can you acquire now that will help you down the road? And that's what I'm going to talk about and informally. I put a few slides together. I've given this talk on a few continents. Uh, let's talk about globalization first. Uh, this article appeared in the Wall Street Journal exactly, yeah, I think almost 11 years ago. And it talked about a mouse called, was titled a mouse called Wanda. All of you folks know what this product is. Uh, it's a mouse and it was developed by a company called Logitech. Logitech, Logitech was one of the early and first truly global companies because when I was talking to the executives, they said our product is sold in every country in the world, bar none. Whether it's Iran, North Korea, and they went from having one, they realized very quickly that globalization was critical. Uh, and they went quickly from having one headquarters to having three corporate headquarters, uh, completely uh, equal in terms of decision making power. And this is when I first took notice of how globalization was critical. Uh, there's another product that I think all of you guys are familiar with in, for multiple uh, reasons. Uh, Apple makes products that have, again, gone all over the world. And let's take, and I thought we could take a look and take a look at one example of an Apple product, do a little bit of analysis and, and take some lessons from that. So if you look at all of the products that Apple makes that you folks are all familiar with. There are some failures and some successes. Let's take a look at the iPad really quickly. So I gave this talk in Israel um, six months ago, well, a little more than six months ago. And that's why if you look at NIS, what I'm talking about is new Israeli shekels, which is a currency there. But again, I, I put this reason, I put this in here because I was going, to, going over the Israeli engineers and some managers in terms of how, why Israel is not making a dent in Apple products. So if you look at this out here, in Israel, in Israel an iPad costs about 20 to 50 new shekels. And there's a big hue and cry about how, you know, how Apple, the iPad is being outsourced to China and how China makes it all. So if you look at it truly, how much does China get from this, from an iPad? 
Let's ask somebody in the audience, how much does China get from the iPad? If you look here. Gets, thir gets 33, 33 shekels. So even though people make a big fuss about China getting the bulk of the work for making an iPad, if you look at how much China gets out of it, it's minimal. Most of the money goes stays in the US where Apple gets a lot of money. Apple gets 736 shekels, where China gets only 33. And so, so there are many different, there are many different models or uh, revenue or what should I say, takeaways from this. One is one can say that one has to, when, you know, whenever you're looking at customers as a manager, you have to look at what the revenue model is. And there are a couple of different approaches. But let me finish this. The iPad cost component breakdown. Here are the countries that that participate in the, in the making of the iPad. Uh, Korea, Taiwan, China, uh, the US and Japan. Uh, Israel, even though it's got such a good reputation as a, what should I say, as a R&D center, as even a, as even a manufacturer, have nothing to do with the iPad. And the reason is very simple. If, uh, if again, if, uh, if labor in Israel is paid about 5,000 shekels a month, uh, the assembly cost of the iPad is going to double or triple very quickly. And so Israel, it will be easy to see why Israel is not, not involved in the manufacturing of the iPad. It was less easy to see why Israel is not involved with the R&D design expert. But the main thing is that there's a whole group of Israeli people thinking about why Israel is not engaged with the iPad, looking at different models. And one of the takeaways from there is that it's very important to understand the consumer. So what the Israelis are trying to do is to put themselves in the shoes of the customer, the shoes of the consumer, to figure out why they were not part of the process. Uh, because it's a tremendously lucrative process, not for China, but for the US. So there are two or three different approaches to understanding the consumer. I have a friend who a little more wealthy than I am. He sold a company called iGate for $4 billion a few months ago. Um, and so Sunil, Sunil Vadwani came to me and said, Gopaya, the one thing that I've learned over all these years is that whenever you enter a new market, don't look at volumes, look at margins. And I didn't know what he meant at that time, but I've slowly figured out what he meant. Well, I had another acquaintance, not a friend, uh, CK Prahala has talked about the fortune at the bottom of the pyramid. So there are multiple approaches, but the bottom line from both of these dramatically different approaches is that you have to understand the consumer. And, and let's go beyond that. What do you folks, what can you pick up as a student? Uh, what, one thing you can pick up is you have to become more aware. Uh, and, you're, and that's true all over life. You have to become more aware of your customer, you have to become more, as professors, we have to become more aware of the audience. If I see a third of the audience dozing off and sleeping, then I know I have to change things around. Um, so you have, so that's one, and I think one thing we realize is that successful people are the ones that are more aware of your peers, your audience, your customers, uh, and so on. Um, to give you, uh, let me give you another example in more of an Indian context. I was, having a drink with my brother-in-law yesterday and he helped develop an organization called Kotak Mahindra that's a fairly decent sized bank here. Um, so he was telling me that he was giving a presentation when they were starting Kotak Mahindra he used to work with Uday Kotak who started uh, the organization and he said that he went they were talking about uh, what should I say uh, about going in for a, some kind of a uh, IPO for a major company, Indian Oil, and one of these companies, and and he and they were strategizing about it overall, uh, and they were here 45 slides, worked very hard, put it together, and finally Uday was going over these slides. And finally Uday said, "Mark, forget all this. Let's go with one slide. This is what the customers wanted." So the one slide said, "Kotak Mahindra will underwrite 100 crores of your effort. This is 100 crores of your money." 10 or 15 years ago. Um, and he said, that's all the slide we needed. He said, we put up that one slide and then everything else followed from there, we got the contract right away. So you have to be, so one of the things that Uday quoted was in this instant was completely aware of what the customer wanted, what the audience wanted. And that's one thing that 
I hope you folks can take from this. If there's one thing you can take from this lecture, it is, it's, it's a need to become even more aware. To give you an idea, uh, in a much smaller context, I was with, I was at dinner yet, yesterday with a whole lot of friends. There were, there were like 10 chapatis there, you know, rice and all that all around. One guy had four chapatis without looking at the others. Was he more aware of his audience? No. Uh, can the person, you know, he can be successful. He, can he be successful? He can probably be successful. But he can be successful despite himself, not because of his awareness. But, so that, I think that's the, that's the one thing that's, that's very important to kind of do as you go through school out here. So let's take a look at how the corporate world is going to evolve in the next few years. Uh, we've talked about the move towards globalization. Uh, we've talked about, well, we haven't talked about this, but there's an emergence of China as a manufacturing center. Uh, Modi is now talking about a Make, make in India initiative. The jury is out on how we're going to do that. Uh, but we've all seen the, I mean, Infosys is right next door, so we've seen the emergence of India as a service center right in your backyard. Uh, the global financial crises, this isn't the singular, it should actually be the plural because there are multiple crises going on. Uh, there's political stability in some parts of the world and there's a huge amount of instability in others. Uh, the, sustain the sustainability and concern for the environment is going stronger. Uh, in the, there's an emergence of Africa as a major source of commodities. So it's, it's, one, it's, it's a, one of the things I hope you become is more familiar with Africa in the next 10, 15 years because I think that's going to become more important in the corporate world as we go along. Now the emergence of India as a major global center for design, for innovation, not yet in manufacturing, the jury is still out. So there's a lot of change that's going to happen in the corporate world. And again, Thomas Friedman's book that you folks are all familiar with uh, was really a wonderful eye-opener for everyone. Uh, Thomas Friedman talked about the flat world and all, Again, you guys have probably heard of the flat world, but it really struck me when Jay Leno uh, said that, uh, Jay Leno came on the show and he looked at all his presents on the Christmas tree, under the Christmas tree on Christmas day, and found that everything was made in China. And so that's, that's where he realized globalization hit home to him. But Thomas Friedman talks about the three steps of globalization, the three stages of globalization. The first was when countries began to globalize, when you know, Britain colonized India, Spain colonized part of the world, and so on. The, sixth, the, the next phase was when companies began to globalize. Uh, you, talk, you hear stories of banana republics, which are the Central American republics, by US companies. Uh, US companies, many German companies, globalized the world. And then this phase is when individuals are beginning to globalize uh, the world. And this is, again, like I said, this is probably the most important change that you folks are going to see in your lifetime. And let me just quickly zip through all of this, where you talk about what globalization means. It means moving resources from more, it used to mean moving resources from more developed countries to low-cost developing countries, but that paradigm has gone away. Uh, there's a lot of reverse innovation that's going on. Uh, when I first left, India 34 years ago, uh, each time I would come back to India, I would buy spices, you know, halvi and turmeric and stuff. And when my sisters in law would come to the US, they would buy all the electronics. Okay. Uh, that was 35 years ago. Today, it's the opposite. I come to India to buy the latest cell phones, and they come to the US to buy the most pure forms of saffron and other spices. So the world has truly come full circle in multiple ways. So yeah, in terms of jobs also, there's a lot of reverse innovation going on. Uh, a lot of the latest, the newest cell phones, for example, are released in India before they are released in the US. And you'll see much more of that as we go along. Uh, there's, also a there's also a global movement of people. Uh, this is true all over China, and one of has to spend a few days in Bangalore to realize that there's a huge amount of movement leading to much social change. That's one of the reasons that whenever I talk to corporate CEOs in India, uh, they say that the biggest challenge they have is human, uh, finding a good human resources manager that can retain their personnel. Uh, if you look at the single, so the single biggest issue with a lot of Indian companies is to reduce 
して、これすなるとは。And this is so different from where it was years and years ago when it was the exact reverse problem. Now, again, there are many reasons for this. The major enablers are cheap airfares for globalization, for the internet, uh, and many governments that are becoming, becoming much more business friendly, including India. Let me just skip through this slide. But here are 10 events that Tom Friedman talked about that flattened the world. And he talked about how the first, first event was not 9-11, but 11-9, when the Berlin Wall came down and East and West, East and West Germany merged together. And he talks about 10 different things. Um, and I give this talk to industrial engineers. Each of these has something to do with industrial engineering. So here's another takeaway take in terms of companies that have been successful and skills that you can take from there. Um, Toyota is one of the most successful companies in the world. It's a global organization. Um, and their whole slogan was, think global, act local. And it's something you can take to your everyday lives. Uh, you can act local, but you have to think in a global perspective. Uh, but here, so here's an example of what Toyota did. Toyota uh, had this pickup truck on the Hilux, H-I-L-U-X, and they built it in about 15 or 18 different factories all over the world. Uh, and they would, instead of, and in the, old, the old model was build everything in Japan and export. Now they built it in all of these places all over the world, and they would adapt the cha the body to suit each climate. So if you looked at Thailand, they made it really monsoon proof. If you looked at Brazil, uh, they made those trucks much more, this with a stronger suspension. And but that's that's one part of it. So that they became a global leader, but the real advantage there was they, that also acted as a currency hedge. Uh, so no matter where your foreign exchange was up or down, you made the same amount of profit. Wonderful strategy. Uh, they did really well as a result of that. Um, another example is closer to home, Hindustan Lever. Uh, we all know the story of Hindustan Lever's small shampoo sachets, which is fortunate at the bottom of the pyramid. But to go beyond that, what Hindustan Lever did was that with rural women, they realized that they couldn't afford many soaps. So they had and so they, they found that people were, people were using the same soap to wash clothes and to have a bath. As a result of that, they marketed one soap for both. They increased their market share significantly. And more importantly, they exported this idea to Africa also. So they started marketing soap in Africa, became hugely successful. Again, an example of think global, act local. Uh, Denon is another company, makes yogurt all over the world, but in every country it changes its name like a chameleon to suit the local names. Now, so these are just three quick examples of how think global, act local can really help you as a, a future manager. Um, this, this thing focuses on next generation management and technical skills. And I got this from a book that's talked about educating the engineer of 2020. Um, so it talks about how you need strong technical skills. Uh, strong technical skills are important, they're critical, they're a necessary condition, but not a sufficient condition in, to, in tomorrow's world. Um, you have to have strong communication skills. It's very critical. Uh, the other thing is project management uh, skills. You look at PMI, the Project Management Institute. It's the fastest growing professional society in the United States. Um, when I joined academia, I won't tell you how many years ago because I won't scare you guys. But uh, over the last 30 years or so, it's gone from maybe a thousand members to 450,000 members as, 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 as a society. Uh, much of their growth has come from uh, countries like India, and also when so and I, and you know, the people who run PMI are good friends. But what they say is that as co projects become more complex, as projects become more in international, they're seeking out people with project management skills. And the better the project manager you are, the better a manager you're going to be. 
And there's also a huge focus on uh, service learning or servant-oriented leadership. Uh, you're, not, you're a leader, but you lead not you lead by serving, not in a traditional, what should I say, kind of leader. Um, the other is an entrepreneurial attitude. Um, if you look at um, if you look at some of the more progressive companies in the world, you say, okay, I said some of you guys are going to be entrepreneurs. Uh, what if you go go work work in a major company, a Fortune 100 company? If you in a Fortune 100 company, then how can you be an entrepreneur? The reality is that that's when you really need to be an entrepreneur. Uh, if you look at what Google does, uh, Google has a huge presence near our house in Pittsburgh. Uh, they give you one day a week. They say don't work on any Google related stuff. For, for half a day a week, take half a day a week, do whatever you want to. Uh, as long as it's got something to do with Google, it doesn't have to be related to anything your boss tells you to do. The other, other half day a week you take, you can work on anything you want to and just tell us what you did. We don't care what you did, just tell us what you did. And as a result of this, now it looks like it's a waste of time, one day a week is gone, loss of productivity. But some huge Google innovations, including Google Maps that we all use, came out of this. So you have to have an entrepreneurial attitude, whether you're in a big company or a small company. You have to be an entrepreneur in life. Uh, the ability to work cross-culturally, critical. Um, again, uh, like I said, in, in the old days, if you were uh, Average engineer who graduated from Boston, you had many more chances than, uh, out, than the out, number one engineer from NIE Mysore. Uh, in tomorrow's world, it doesn't really matter where you graduated from. Uh, you all have an equal chance. And when I was talking to a, one of the Heinz CEOs, uh, a former one, he was telling me the next generation of corporate leaders are going to be ones that can work seamlessly anywhere in the world. So whether you were born in, or you were studying in Mysore or Mannheim in Germany or Manila in the Philippines or Montevideo in Uruguay, you have the same chance and the same ability to get things done. So, so that's in terms of that's in terms of some of the, what students can do. Now there are many many implications for educators also. As educators, we have to add new and relevant areas into the curriculum. Uh, and again, I find many Indian universities uh, are not that progressive in terms of adding curriculum. I, I looked at, I look, I work with a few Indian universities here, and my, what I tell the department chairs and deans is that if you can recognize the curriculum from 10 or 15 years ago, you're doing something wrong. Uh, when the fundamental concepts are the same, it's, about 20 or 30 percent of your courses have to be changed, have to be reinvigorated. Re uh, students have to engage in team based experiences starting from the very beginning. This is from an undergrad class. Uh, and you have to be able to provide students with multiple entry points and exit points. To be able to take a semester off, come back and come back without missing a beat. Because that's what the new generation of students is demanding. And this is one thing we were talking about earlier: is that you need to we need to develop international partnerships uh, in the sense that universe, the days for universities and colleges to stand alone are gone. We really need to hook up hook up with alliances from all over the world. And my feeling is that in a few years, maybe five eight years down the road, uh, just like you have airlines have alliances like the Star Alliance, the One World Alliance, I think universities are going to have the alliance similar alliances. So students could come spend one semester in Myra, one semester in Einhorn, one semester in Pittsburgh, one semester somewhere else, and graduate with a, with a common degree. It's just a question of time before it's going to happen. And I'll and I'll explain. I'll go over some of the reasons. And just like just like companies have companies have focused on the think global, act local. Uh, I think academia can also focus on think global, act local.
And again, the other takeaway is that you have to remake yourself every few years. This is a this is just shows how industrial engineering research areas have changed from the early days, which is your top left hand corner, all the way down to different research areas for today. You can just see how you, as you as you go clockwise, you can see how you kind of move different research areas. So, so when I come back and see Indian engineering colleges that have a curriculum from the early days, I'm amazed and I'm kind of a little surprised. So one of my big pushes is to try to see if we can modernize the curriculum in multiple engineering disciplines out there. So what can you do as a student? So as a student, there are many, many things you can do. Um, you can maintain professional currency. Your know, education doesn't end after you get a degree out here. If you haven't learned something, uh, learned a new skill uh, in the last two or three years, uh, when you're out in the workforce, it means you're outdated. Now, with business, it's less important than in engineering. But in electrical engineering, this is the average electrical engineer gets outdated in three years, in 36 months, unless you pick, unless you continue to maintain your professional currency. You have to always recognize that there's room for continuous improvement. Um, I do a fair amount of consulting with companies in the US, or I used to actually. And whenever a plant, you meet a plant manager, and the plant manager tells you and says, you know, my factory is fantastic. Let me show show you how good it is. And you know that because it's a big story. And if it's that good, why are you calling me as a consultant? Okay. Um, so those are the kinds. So you have to recognize that there's always room for improvement. So you don't want to go with people who only show you the good stuff. You have to go below that and see where you are. Uh, you have to develop an international perspective and focus on servant leadership. Um, these are just, this is all motherhood and apple pie. But let me just talk a couple, for a couple of minutes on, on faculty, on what faculty can do in So here's what's happening now in the world in terms of, in terms of education itself. Uh, there are more and more courses coming with a, with a global context. There's a lot of focus on humanity. Uh, there's a fair amount of focus on experiential learning. Study abroad is becoming much, much more popular now than it was a few years ago. Uh, tuition costs a lot. You know, now, tuition in India is small compared to what it costs in the US. It's just ho become horribly expensive. And there's a lot of internet that's being used for problem solving. So how can we use this to our advantage at colleges? Uh, there's a lot of on MOOCs being offered, online courses being offered. And how will these affect us at MITRA? Will the relationship, if you are using the internet a lot, what is the relationship between faculty and students? How, is it, how important is the physical location of a faculty member? Could you folks be taking courses from a faculty room at Manchester all semester? Um, and 15 years ago, the answer was there's no way, there's nothing substitute for personal experience. Uh, has, has technology really changed that paradigm? Now, will we provide more online content in the future? What can be done online, what cannot? And we are all wrestling with this. Will faculty do traditional lectures at all anymore? Uh, there's a lot of Research being shown that active learning, where the students do all the reading before they come to class, and they just use the class for discussion. And you almost do a pre-exam before you come into class. I think you guys will enjoy that. The pre-exam before you come to class. If you don't pass an exam, you don't even come. To, you're not even allowed to come to class. And the class is used only for discussions. We've experimented that with a couple of courses at my university, and again, it's, it's in the early stages. The jury's out whether it's a better model or not. Uh, but there's a lot more student learning out here. And how will the trends affect MIGA? How will it affect Indian universities? How will it affect foreign universities? Will you need, you may need fewer faculty. Uh, will the work date change? Will faculty be reduced to just discussion agents and not faculty anymore? We don't know that. And what's the future of the learning environment? These, so these are just leadership skills, not as an individual, but as a school, as a university. So if you look at what we do today, this is what we do today as, as professors and teachers. Uh, what will we do differently in the future? Now this is just a hypothetical kind of scenario, where you assign your online course content, students study these lectures, come to class in discussion, you standardize exams with a question bank, there's no grading. Is that better or not in terms of learning? 
can do the juries out there. We have talked about this already, the curricula from schools are harmonized. So the question is, how can Myra leverage these trends? Uh, should, should I ask Dr. Shalniars to offer MIT $10 million in exchange to all the course materials in 20 years? Because a lot of the course material is online. Uh, what's the best economic model? Uh, will faculty scholarship, will faculty become glorified TAs or not? Can faculty size be reduced? So there's multiple questions. Yes, just as you guys are going to change, uh, your, your future managers are going to change, uh, in, education in business schools is also going to dramatically change in the next 10 years. So in summary, I think educators need to change coursework to educate students. Uh, new ideas of research are going to evolve very quickly. Uh, faculty and students must become more global. Managers need to re-energize themselves every few years. It's very easy to become outdated. I think project management is becoming increasingly important. I've seen, I've, and the playing field today is flat. So it's up to you folks as future managers to take the lead. And with that, very quickly, I'll answer any questions that you have and come to an end. Thank you. Come to India is that, uh, and whenever I do these accreditation visits, I think I've probably gone to about 20 countries in the world to accreditation visits. And we always go before a school class. And uh, we ask the class for questions. And you, you know, depending on which country it is, how long it takes for the first question to arrive. And all my colleagues who are accreditors say that in India, it takes the longest for the first question to come. So let's prove that wrong and <laughs> ask me a question. Uh, it's uh, very great uh, for us to listen to your great lecture. Uh, my question is, where do you see universities heading after 10 years with explosion of MOOCs? There are great courses by great, great leaders in every academic area being offered in MOOCs and that at affordable cost. So where do you see this innovation going ahead? You know, that's a very good question. Uh, if I had the right answer, I'd be a multi-millionaire. Uh, the reality is that MOOCs are available, they are here to stay. Uh, my colleagues at Georgia Tech now offer a complete master's degree in computer science for $6,000 flat and what should I say, and you get a regular MS degree from Georgia Tech for $6,000. Uh, that was developed because they got a lot of help from IBM. Now is that going to be the standard down the road? I, I talked to a couple of Georgia Tech faculty, they don't think so. They think they're still, so we don't know yet. The jury's out, we're seeing MOOCs come in in the first, and it's in the early stages right now. I think we'll know in the next five, eight years how things are going to move forward. But one thing is guaranteed, the MOOCs are here to stay, they're not going to go away. Uh, and I think it's up to faculty members to start using more online materials, uh, more online you know, board lectures, one way or another, whether it's YouTube videos, uh, whether it's <coughs> online lectures, social media, and so on. Now, for example, to give you an idea how, I mean, not just moves, but uh, we have a capstone design course. Before you graduate, you have to finish a good course. At one time, we used to have a traditional PowerPoint presentation uh, to, the, to the company and to the faculty. Uh, we stopped doing that. We now say, ask students to do a four minute YouTube video instead. And say, if you can convince then that this project saved X amount of dollars, that's enough. So, we have, so I think faculty have to start using more online materials. How much they will use, whether they will go completely to MOOCs or not, I, that's a tough question to answer. Sure. So 
I think the problem just going through this online completely is to miss out on learning that you would use. No, I, ab I absolutely think so. I think, I think going all the way to online definitely doesn't work out. On the other hand, the way people are being brought up today, uh, attention spans are getting shorter and shorter. And people are increasingly, people want to learn, but not necessarily in a traditional classroom format. So the question is, what's the happy, happy balance, what's the happy medium in the next five, ten years? Uh, one thing I can guarantee is that ten years down the road, uh, Myra will be very different and other universities, progressive universities are going to be very different from today. Uh, will they go 100% to move? Probably not. But will they have four courses being beamed in from four parts of the world here, where you can interact directly with a faculty member from somewhere in the world? If, say, the University of Montevideo, as the best person in operations management, why should you offer four courses? Let that one person offer it for you, four partner universities from around the world. And you know, and with today's technology, uh, you know, with, with, with say something like Cisco Telepresence, the person is right in the room. You can't. It's, you know, it's amazingly real. And this is today. Five years, and technology is going to grow even more. So you're right. You, you, you won't, so you'll have a network here, but the faculty member may be somewhere else. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, they say uh, entrepreneurs should be more like leaders than being a manager. As you said, uh, example of Google, where they have intrapreneurs, right? So where you focus more on becoming an entrepreneur yourself than becoming a manager. So what's your comment on that? So should they be more of leaders than managers? I think there's a place for managers. In a place in one's life cycle where you're a manager, but I think when you're graduating from a place like Myra, I would hope that every one of you want to be complete leaders. I don't think there are many people that say I want to be average. Uh, you, everybody wants to be above average. And if, I think I think everybody would want to be a leader. Leaders can also make decent managers, and it's not necessarily mutually exclusive. Uh, so I think you can really be a good leader and a good manager. I like to have your cake and eat it too. Uh, yeah. I'm not a student here. I work with Inclusive's uh, sure. Leadership Institute. Uh, you spoke about servant leadership. And I'm also looking at uh, the various organizations and the way in which we need to aggressively move towards innovation or you know, growth in whichever sector we are a part of. Um, what is the role that you see that servant leadership has in the current scheme of things where things are moving at a much faster pace? Actually, yeah, that's, you know, that's a question after my own heart. Uh, I'm working with another well-known prof uh, professor who's more, much more well-known than I am, like John Kimmelis. On a, on a concept of the business of humanity. I actually think servant leadership, the concept of humanity, is going to become much more important and for all the wrong reasons. And the reason I'm saying it's all the wrong reasons is that companies are allowed to make money. There's no question. You know, companies are driven by stakeholders. Uh, unfortunately, in today's environment, companies tend to, tend to what shall I say, to uh, make poor decisions because they're only thinking of shareholder shareholder interests every quarter and they're driven every quarter. Um, what we have, what's one, one of the concepts we are, we are proving as we speak is the fact that if companies make long-term decisions that are based on community needs, they end up making the right decisions long-term. Uh, so if you look at, uh, well, let me give you an example that's close to home. Uh, when Walmart tried to enter <coughs> India, uh, they work with Sunil Bharti Mitchell, you know, um, the, the Bharti entered that. So we, we met him a few times, we interviewed him, and it became very, I mean, he was just a wonderful business, man, business leader, no question about it. His whole focus was short-term profit right away. As a result of that, when Walmart came in, they stubbed their toes in so many different ways, uh, because they were not looking at community needs first. They were looking at the short-term profit first. And there are so many examples of companies that look for short-term profits. Uh, and as a result, in the long term, they, they hurt themselves. 
Now, people say, well, with CSR in India, we have to take 2.5% of our profits and give it to CSR activities. That's fine, but it's not part of your mission. So our whole thesis is that if helping the community is part of your mission to begin with, you end up making the right decisions long term. Now, while if it's a CSR after that, I take 2% of my profits and give it out to some, if that, those things won't work so well as what we found in the research that we've done. But thank you, that's a very, that's a very relevant topical question. Well, even whatever you've shared, uh, Dr. Bhopin, I just want to also hear from you. So what are then ways in which we can instill the confidence in organizations that the role of servant leadership is here to stay? That community building, you know, that kind of a, a environment is something that they need to create. That's a, good, that's a very good question. When I took the engineers now, uh, when I was in engineering college a couple of years ago, uh, um, 30 years ago. But, uh, I, so at that point, all we cared about was getting a job. If you look at the young, new, new generation of students in first year college, second year college, they so much more care for the environment, they so much more into sustainability than, than we were at, when growing up. So each generation that's coming up, they're driven by the right reasons, thankfully so, than we were growing up. Uh, so that's why I think there's a huge imperative in the responsibility of the part of an organization to really make that part of your integral mission as opposed to something on the side. And I think it's going to happen. In fact, uh, I'm amazed in India looking at the number of organizations here. Uh, in Bangalore, my sister-in-law is a business journalist. She uh, gives me tons and tons of company names of people who come, come back to India for the right reasons. Uh, and some of the decisions they're making are wonderful and they make a profit also, a nice healthy profit also. Uh, so in the traditional accounting paradigm, it's profits versus CSR. I mean, that's not, I mean, they work together. It's the Thank you so much. a question for me on behalf of the students. We have many of our students have engineering backgrounds over here. Right? How many of you have engineering backgrounds? Just raise wow. your hand. Okay. <laughs> wow. There are. And this is very unusual for us to have a speaker here very, very firmly grounded in engineering and in a technical school. Um, it's a career in engineering and manufacturing. So here's my question on behalf of some of the engineering students here, is when they move into uh, management profession, how close should they remain to technology? You know, how much should they spend in their time being technologists who are managers versus being managers who are, who are left behind an engineering career? Is that a question? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. So on that behalf. He, uh, he used to yank my chain 30 years ago. He's even asking me a difficult question at that <laughs> But, but you know, that's, that's a very topical question. Uh, I'm of the opinion that all engineering does is teaches you to think rationally and make good decisions. Okay. Having said that, I think it's very important to uh, have domain expertise in something, uh, whatever it is, whether it's a technical field, whether it's a service-oriented field, whether it's in hospitality. You know, I think it's very, the sooner you have domain expertise, you develop domain expertise, the better off you are. Now, it happens to be technology, fantastic. If it's not technology, that's okay too. Your engineering is still going to help you. Uh, we have the National Football League. Football teams are very popular. Uh, American football are very popular uh, in the US. Uh, some of the finest coaches are, have an engineering background because what they say is it's starting to solve problems and think rationally. Uh, I think it's important to have domain expertise. Uh, I joke around with our MBA students at the Cats Graduate School of Business and say that all an MBA will buy you is 25 cents and a cup of coffee. Uh, and I'm, I'm being facetious, but not only so. And I think it's very important. I mean, you, you've been given outstanding leadership skills here, management skills here. So what you want to be able to do is to find a domain, whatever that domain is, and really get expertise in one, in one, in one area.
Other questions? Okay, going once, twice. Thank you. So.